<clears throat> good morning and good, good morning. evening, um, all the particip participants uh, of the ICC. Today, we are so happy to have the Professor Tong Si here be with us. Uh, we are so honored and our pleasure to have Professor Si to share his uh, experience in dealing with the patient with the malocclusion and uh, to show his experience uh, with the advancement technique and uh, how to cooperate with in between the orthodontics and uh, the surgeon. And by beside, I will introduce uh, today our moderator, the prior. So I will give the time to more to, to prepare for the moderating. Thank you, prior. Please go ahead. Okay, um, today is my honor to see all of you again, ICC member. Uh, my name is Pat, and today I will be the co moderator with Dr. P. Y. Shou and Dr. Chun Ye Chu. Uh, we have a distinguished international speaker from the Netherlands, Dr. Tong Si, to give us the presentation today. And before we start the session, I would like to introduce the panelists of the session. Um, the first panelist, Dr. Bowen Kong Noi, uh, on a surgeon and a medical doctor. He received the German and Thai boards of oral and maxillofacial surgery. He specialized in the jaw reconstruction, OSA, and autonomic surgery. He worked as an uh, assistant professor at Mahidon University, Bangkok, Thailand. And the second panelist, Dr. Yufang Liao, uh, the chair of Graduate Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Science, Shanghai University, and a professor at the Department of Craniofacial Autonics, Shanghai Memorial Hospital, Taiwan. She came on them 200 cases this year using computing assistant autonomic surgery. Her special interests are in autonomic surgery, clap and sleep apnea. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker, Dr. Tong Si, to everyone. Dr. Tong Si is an oral mesofacial uh, surgeon at the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at Red Bell University Medical Center in Nemigan, the Netherlands. As the team lead for the autonomic team, he has specialized expertise in the treatments of uh, congenital and acquired dental facial deformity with a primary focus on autonomic surgery and facial recontouring. In the Netherlands, Dr. C has been a pioneer in the development and uh, implementation of digital workflow in autonomic surgery for over 15 years. Annually, he contributes to the successful treatment of more than 200 autonomic cases. Beyond his clinical commitments, Dr. C also coordinates numerous uh, national and international research projects and to develop validate and implement cutting edge 3D imaging technologies, digital workflow and artificial intelligence algorithm in the fields of autonomic surgery. Through collaboration efforts with autonomous, he has introduced new autonomic surgical technique as well as treatment principle to daily clinical practice. These innovations aim to minimize the overall durations of treatment and enhance the predictabilities of treatment outcome. Over the years, Dr. C had made a significant academic contribution, authoring over 90 peers review papers in various national and international journals. Furthermore, he had been an invited lecturer at numerous international conference, webinar, and academic courses, actively contribute to the post academic education in the field of autonomic surgery. And now it's time for uh, Dr. Tongsi presentation. Welcome Dr. Tongsi, it's our honor to have you today. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon and good evening, uh, yeah, my friends and dear colleagues. Um, I think it's really an honor to be invited to contribute to the ICC forum. Um, yeah, I think the Changu Memorial Hospital has always been a center of excellence in the craniofacial surgery. And it's really a privilege for me to share my knowledge, I think, with all of you and with everyone who's attending this ICC. And very thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cho and uh, Pryor, for your invitation and all the preparations and your kind words. Well, I start up my presentation. Uh, um,
So, well, uh, so today um, I'm going to talk about the principles in the surgical planning of orthodontic surgery. And I think the focus of this presentation is not only on the technology, but actually on the principles of treatments. And um, this cannot be done by myself alone. I'm always doing this with my um, orthodontist who are working really closely with me. So I think it's really about the collaboration between orthodontics and about with a surgeon uh, in order to achieve uh, an optimal and predictable results. Um, well, um, I work at the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery of the Rathaus University Medical Center in Netherlands. And uh, our hospital has a slogan uh, in order, yeah, which is actually to innovate and to deliver personalized healthcare. Uh, our Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery is situated in four different parts of the hospital. Uh, there's a part uh, within the Center for Oral and Facial Surgery in which orthokinetic surgery actually falls into. Uh, there's also the Center for Cleft and Craniofacial Surgery, which is a part of the pediatric hospital. Uh, we also um, have a Center for Oncology and Reconstructive Surgery, mainly dealing with oncological patients and reconstructive surgery. And finally, we house the largest uh, 3D imaging lab of Western Europe. Uh, myself, I, I'm trained as an oral maxillofacial surgeon, so I'm global qualified in dentistry and general medicine. My focus right now as a department is orthokinetic surgery, as well as secondary trauma reconstructions, and I'm also a part of the transgender team within our hospital. Um, besides the clinical work, I'm also the research coordinator of the department. Uh, so I coordinate all the clinical uh, trials within the department, as well as the 3D related studies. And the focus of the research uh, is actually on the optimization of 3D surgical planning, and also has now more and more focus on the AI assisted diagnostics and planning, which is, I think, uh, the future in the coming five to 10 years. And uh, what I also uh, really like is our collaboration with the Changbo Memorial Hospital, uh, because yeah, we uh, do joint research projects as well. Uh, also with the Department of Orthodontics and uh, with our PhD students. Well, um, if you talk about uh, principles in the uh, orthokinetic planning, I think there are three major um, parts which I would like to focus on today. Uh, in the first part of my presentation, which is about 10 to 15 minutes, I'll be talking about the transition from the traditional 2D cephalometric based planning to the 3D soft tissue driven planning, how this transition has been in, in our departments. The second part, which is the largest part of my presentation, will be on the contemporary workflow in orthopedic surgery, focusing on different stages of the treatment. And the last part, which I will only just highlight, is the future of orthopedic surgery or the philosophy which we are now adopting within our center. And this is, um, yeah, with the slogan, less is more, one day diagnostics, one stage surgery. Uh, well, let's focus first on the part one, the transition from the traditional 2D cephalometry to 3D soft tissue driven planning. Uh, Orthopedic surgery uh, is actually was focusing on all different kinds of severe mild occlusions, which cannot be corrected by orthodontics alone. So all these different kinds of uh, severe mild occlusions that cannot be treated by orthodontists alone are being referred to the surgeons to be treated surgically. The focus of orthodontic surgery was to establish a stable class one occlusion. So the midline should be uh, correct. And also the sagittal relationship of the upper and lower dentition should be aligned, as well as there should be a correct transverse relationship between the upper and the lower arch. This was the main focus of orthokinetic surgery in, in its beginning years. So the orthokinetic workflow consisted of three parts. First, the clinical analysis. Second, the cephalometry. And last, model surgery before going to the OR. According to the traditional clinical analysis, uh, we used to look at the facial height ratio and also to look at the sagittal facial ratio, which can be uh, classified to anti-face, straight face, 
and retrophase according to the Frankfurt plane and different um, reference lines. So this is how we used to analyze the patients in the clinic about 20 years ago at our departments. Um, in addition to the clinical examination of the orthognatic patients, we also take lateral cephalograms. And on these cephalograms, we identify different uh, anatomical landmarks upon which we can perform all different kinds of orthognatic analysis. The mostly used ones at our departments were the Steiner analysis, the Witz analysis, the Downs analysis, and the McNamara analysis. These were all uh, measurements that had to be performed prior to surgery. And uh, when looking at these different cephalometric values, the goal of surgery was just to normalize these abnormal values, which is really the focus of surgery. In order to um, do predictions in a traditional way, the predictor tracings were actually being performed by using these lateral cephalograms. Um, we kind of uh, wanted to simulate where the soft tissue would end up, and we uh, used different ratio, the hard tissue, soft tissue, mainly anterior, posterior uh, direction ratios to uh, simulate where the nose, the upper lip, lower lip, and the chin will end up after jaw displacements. So uh, the traditional way at our department of analyzing the nose was to use the pronasale as a, a landmark. And if the incisor is being uh, advanced by 10 millimeters, the pronasale will probably only go forward by two millimeters. And there will be a little bit of vertical um, yeah, cranial movements of the nose tip as well. And the same we do to the upper lip and the lower lip, and uh, all these different ratios are just based on normative values, which uh, were calculated in a very small group of patients, mainly Caucasian patients. Um, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, many, many researchers have been focusing on these different ratios. Uh, the more I look at these ratios, the more puzzled I really get, because, yeah, which one should you actually choose, and how reliable are these? Uh, those were quite, I think, uh, valid questions at that time. And uh, after uh, looking at the cephalograms, we also used to do Facebook registrations and also make plaster casts. By using the Facebook registration, we put these plaster casts into the model articulators, which are based on average values of the Bennett angle as well as the occlusal slope. Uh, as dyskinetic patients, they are dyskinetic, so they where they are not normal. So that's why these kind of model surgery uh, are, in my view, not accurate to predict how the jaw should be positioned. And based on this model surgery, we used to make acrylic um, splints uh, ourselves so that we can use them during surgery. And there was always um, the controversy of uh, how to achieve a stable class one occlusion and also at the same time to achieve uh, an acceptable uh, facial profile. Sometimes, so uh, yeah, we, we had to always to compromise uh, either the occlusion or the aesthetics using the traditional planning. So this is an example of a 16-year-old girl who attended our department about 20 years ago. Uh, she uh, actually just wanted to have a normal class one occlusion. Uh, so by just doing a BSS advancement, we could also, uh, well, uh, give her a better profile. But if you look at her profile closely, you do see uh, different suboptimal elements, such as a chin position and a cervical uh, line, as well as, I think, the asymmetry, which you also can notice in the frontal view. But at that time, we were more and more focused on the occlusion rather than on the soft tissue results. So we regarded these results as very acceptable. Uh, at that time, I think 80% of orthognatic surgery was just a BSSO or the for one uh, osteotomy, the so-called monomax. And I think only 20% of surgery was a biomax surgery, which was really able to change the profile of the patient. With the technological advancements uh, which were emerging, I think, after the millennium, 
especially on 3D imaging. Uh, our department um, yeah, housed the first 3D lab, I think, in the Netherlands. So in 2006, uh, we um, acquired the first 3D MD photo stereo photogrammetry so that we can capture the, the skin texture of the patients in 3D. At the same time, we also acquired the first generation ICAT CBCT scanner so that we can also capture the skeletal um, uh, structure of the patient in a very fast and efficient way. And finally, we used to use uh, radio opaque impression materials to take impression of the upper and lower jaw simultaneously so that we can also scan these uh, impressions to digitalize the dentition. And by using uh, various uh, fusion models, uh, we could in 2006 already uh, render these kind of 3D augmented head models, which are composed of skin texture and a detailed uh, 3D view of the uh, skeletal uh, tissue, as well as the dentition. Uh, the second uh, part, which really fueled the transition from 2D to 3D, is actually uh, three great uh, professors which work together at our department. So Professor Berger was the head of department and he came to our department in 2006 and he was the initiator of the 3D lab. At the same time, the head of department of orthodontics, Professor Anna-Marie Kavis jachmann also uh, collaborated with our department to make the 3D planning possible. And the last contributor was of course, uh, Dr. Gwen Svenen, from uh, Bruges in Belgium. And uh, with three professors, we formed a 3D facial imaging research group, Nijmegen Bruges in 2006, which is the foundation of the transition from a 2D to 3D. This research group provided uh, scientific evidence um, for the value of the 3D planning in its uh, yeah, earlier days. And I think the last part which we which fueled the transition from 2D to 3D uh, is the fact that the lead surgeon in orthopedic surgery at the department in 2000, uh, uh, 2008, at that time was Dr. De Koning. He attended the Arnett course in the US and he adopted the soft tissue driven planning, which was advocated by Arnett at that time. So by having these technological advancements in 3D imaging, the establishment of a 3D lab and a research group at our department in 2006 and the adoption of the principles of the soft tissue-based surgical planning, all these three factors made it possible for us to implement 3D planning in Nijmegen in routine patients, uh, uh, yeah, in patient care in, from 2008 onwards. So from 2008 onwards, all biomaterial osteotomies in Nijmegen were planned in 3D in the virtual uh, environment. And so I guess uh, at that time, we were one of the early adapters, uh, definitely, I think, in Europe. Well, uh, having looked at the history of this transition from 2D to 3D, uh, let's take a detailed look at the contemporary workflow in orthokinetic surgery. Um, when we treat an orthokinetic patient, um, the, the whole workflow um, consists of five different steps. The first step is uh, to see the patient in a multidisciplinary consultation. Usually a new patient, orthokinetic patient, is being referred to me by the orthodontist, and I see the patient together with the orthodontist in uh, his or her office for the first time to see uh, what the situation is, what the problem was, what was the chief complaint, and what the expectation of the patients um, um, is it really something which we can treat. Uh, the second uh, step is actually to establish a pre-surgical orthodontics plan and to carry out the pre-surgical orthodontics aimed to decompensate the dental arches and to level the dental arches. After the pre-surgical orthodontics, um, um, then we go to the third step, which consists of the pre-operative documentation and the 3D virtual surgical planning. And after having made this virtual surgical planning, we then carry it out in the OR in form of different kinds of orthokinetic surgery. And the last part 
is the approach of orthodontics to refine the interdigitation and to evaluate the result of surgery to see whether it is concordant with a 3D virtual surgical planning. And these five steps, um, I will yeah, describe them in details. So um, the first part is a multidisciplinary consultation with the orthodontist. During this consultation, we look at the face of the patient very uh, closely. Uh, we look at five different elements. So we look at the facial symmetry, the facial harmony, the facial characteristics, the state of the dentition, and also the occlusion, as well as the patient's own perception of the problem. Um, and in many cases, if there is a kind of asymmetry, and if the patient really tells us that asymmetry is progressive, um, I think it's really important to quantify the condylar growth at this stage. The traditional way of quantifying the condylar growth is by making a bone scintigraphy by using 99M technetium scans and by uh, intravenously uh, giving the patients the 99 technetium, they are being uptaked by the condyles if there is any kind of condylar growth. And after uh, several hours of, up, of uptake, um, a spec scan will be made. And on these spec scans, quantitative measurements will be made. The, the hotspots will be found in the condylar region. And we measure how dark uh, these hotspots are. If there's more than 10% of difference in activity between the left and the right side, we can conclude that there is a significant uh, difference in condylar growth. However, these kind of examinations uh, poses quite a high radiation dose, about three to four millisieverts, equivalent to 30 or 40 uh, panoramic radiographs, I think for the younger patient group. And this is a clear disadvantage. And also the SPEC scan also takes uh, several hours to perform, uh, which is uh, quite a time consuming examination. Um, but however, uh, we have to um, address the problem of progressive mandibular asymmetry if the patient who comes to our office says that he or she sees that the mandibular asymmetry is becoming more and more severe throughout the years. So the first question we have to answer is, is there an active condylar growth? If the answer is yes, um, high condylectomy can be performed to, um, to stop the condylar hyperactivity on the right side. If there is no active condylar growth, we can then continue with the orthokinetic treatments. In 2013, in, together with the Department of Nuclear Medicine, uh, we introduced the sodium fluoride PET-CT scan. So instead of uh, using 99 technetium as a radio uh, pharmacon, uh, we use the 18 fluoride as a pharmacon because the 18 fluoride has a much faster uh, decay time and because of the fast decay time and also the intrinsic properties of the emission uh, of the gamma rays, uh, there is a two to three times increase in the resolution of these images. And we can combine these images with a PET-CT scan so that we can have a clear 3D view of where the hyperactivity of the condor is located. Uh, in comparison to the SPECT scan, uh, um, sodium fluoride pet CT is much less time consuming because the incubation time is only 30 to 60 minutes and it halves the radiation dose, which is especially very advantageous for these younger patients. So from 2013 onwards, uh, sodium fluoride pet CT scan is becoming the clinical standard in our hospital and more and more hospitals in the Netherlands are referring patients to our hospital to undergo this kind of quantification of a possible condylar growth. If uh, one condyle is uh, clinically growing uh, faster than the other one, and it's also radiologically uh, proven that there is a form of condylar hyperactivity, then we perform a high condylectomy, um, especially uh, in growing young patients. So with, uh, through a very limited preauricular incision, through the tragus, we um, um, gain uh, access to the condylar area. And by using very small incisions, 
um, and also by using piezo um, surgery, we can remove the cranial five to six millimeters of the condylar uh, surface to halt the condylar growth. And afterwards, we suture the skin uh, very carefully so that uh, nearly no scarring actually happens after these kind of high condylectomies. By performing the high condylectomies um, in an early stage, uh, we see in our clinic that many patients who had progressive mandibular asymmetric growth, uh, they tend to grow uh, normally and no secondary surgery is required in more than half of these patients. So we think it's very beneficial uh, to look at the progression of mandibular asymmetric, asymmetric growth at the early stage. Well, uh, let's now focus on the pre-surgical orthodontics because I think in the second stage, uh, we have to establish a pre-surgical orthodontic plan. And it is at this stage that we have to create the decompensated and congruent dental arches because the majority of our patients, I think 70 to 80% of our patients is class two patients. So although we do uh, adopt surgery first protocol in many, many cases of class two patients, it's just very difficult uh, to do surgery first um, yeah, protocol. And that's why uh, in majority of the patients, we do the pre-surgical orthodontics first. Uh, it is at this stage that we try to use orthodontics to facilitate the surgical jaw movements and to, in order to enhance the facial profile. So we do not only concentrate on the dental arches, but we use a facial profile as a backwards driven planning for the pre-surgical orthodontics. One of the key questions in this stage is, as a stage, is to extract or not to extract premolars, especially if there is crowding and especially if there's class two jaw deformity, which requires a certain amount of pre-surgical overjet. So um, nowadays, uh, whether or not to extract is really being determined by these two factors, and more and more emphasis is being put on the second factor the amount of required pre-surgical overjet, which is then determined by itself uh, by the desired facial profile. These are two examples of class two patients uh, with horizontal uh, growth pattern and a vertical growth pattern. Uh, although the chin is retruded in uh, both of these patients, uh, we can see that their facial, uh, uh, their facial contour and the jaw contour and the soft tissue contour are completely different. Um, in the clinic, we um, examine these patients in their natural head position, and we use a true vertical line as proposed by Arnett to see how the upper lip, how the lower lip, and how the soft tissue chin are related to this true vertical line in order to determine the amount of mandibular advancement uh, that should be used to normalize these soft tissue values. Of course, we also take uh, the patient's um, desire into account. If a patient wants to have a more protruded chin, then we tend to uh, plan the, the surgery, uh, the uh, surgical advancement more. Whereas if the patient wants a softened jawline, then we uh, plan less surgical advancements. But it is at the pre-surgical orthodontic stage that we are already determined the amount of uh, mandible advancement that is required in order to achieve an optimal uh, soft tissue profile. Um, well, let's uh, take a closer look in this case. And this is a young man about 16 year old, uh, class 2-2 uh, mal occlusion with a deep bite. If you look at the uh, reference line on the right side, you can see that advancement of the chin of the soft tissue pogonium of about six to seven millimeters is required in order to get a straight profile in this case, so that the patient has a one-third antiphase, uh, which is really desired by the male patients. Um, we do perform a little bit of cephalometry. Uh, usually, we measure the Arnett angle of the upper and lower incisor. And uh, from these Arnett angles, we can see that the lower incisors are being inclined properly, whereas the upper incisors, they have an excess in, in Arnett angle, which means that the inclination of the upper incisors can be optimized by giving them more inclination to the labial side. 
And these are the occlusal views of the same patients. So in many of these class 2-2 patients, the upper incisors are being retroclined, uh, but just by proclining the upper incisors in this case, uh, we can see that we can already achieve about five to six millimeters of dental overjets. So in this case, no extraction is required in my view. This is another class two patients who has a vertical uh, growth pattern and also is hypodivergent and who has an anterior open bite and also lip incompetence. If you look at her uh, chin position from the soft tissue nasale, from the true vertical line, you see that the soft tissue pogonium should be advanced more than 10 millimeters in order to achieve a better facial profile. Uh, we have also measured the Arnett's angles in this case. And in her case, the upper incisors are inclined properly, whereas the lower incisors, as you can also see on the left, the cephal cephalograms, they are inclined too much to the labial side. And because the overjet is very small in this case, and because of the inclination of the lower incisors, we choose to extract two premolars in the lower jaw in order to decompensate the dental arch and in order to uh, create uh, more um, overjets so that we can advance the lower jaw to a more anterior position to optimize the facial profile. Uh, we also, um, if you look at these uh, models, uh, on the top row, you see the models of a class one uh, patient who has a stable occlusion. And in the bottom row, you see an uh, example of a class two mal occlusion. Um, and in this case, if you look at the models closely, you always see in many class two one cases that the uh, upper incisors are being uh, proclined a lot. There is usually lip interposition. And because of the, the big overjets and the cheek pressure, the molars and premolars in the upper jaw are being constricted more to the palatal side. And so many, many of our class two patients have a transversely constricted upper arch in combination with proclination of the upper incisors and a retro position of the lower dental arch. But besides the sagittal uh, um, deformity, in many, many of these class two patients which we treat also has a transverse deformity. And when they laugh or smile, the smile line is very narrow and this is characterized by the presence of the black buccal corridors. And these are uh, yeah, not so aesthetically pleasing if you want to achieve a very nice aesthetic dental smile line. And so the transverse uh, size of the upper jaw is also an issue in many of these patients. And this is uh, the same model of the class two patients. If we uh, advance the lower jaw to get rid of uh, the overjets, then something also happens in the transverse direction. If you look at closely at these models and at this uh, animation, you see if you advance the lower jaw in this kind of patients, you will create a transverse problem in the premolar area uh, of the patients. And so this is what we call an anticipated crossbite in class two patients. So when we see that a patient, a class two patient want to have a lot of lower jaw advancements, um, we have to take into account that extra expansion of the upper arch is required, not only aesthetically, but also for the stability of surgery. So how do we um, expand the upper jaw? Well, um, we know that from the uh, earlier studies that expansion orthodontically is one of the least stable movements. So uh, we tend to expand these post-adolescent patients skeletally by using the SARMI technique, the surgically assisted rapid maxillary expansion. SARMI can be performed under sedation or under general anesthesia. Um, it is a surgery which can be done within, I think, 20 minutes. But however, it does give a patient quite some facial swelling as well as post-operative pain. And SARMI can be achieved by uh, using a two-spawn distractor, a so-called Hyrex, which is being put into the upper arch by the orthodontist before surgery, or using a bone-borne distractor, a TPD. Um, the, the research at our department has shown that the efficacy of both of these distractors are similar, but however, 
uh, in case of bone board extractors, we do have to take it out later on, which can be quite a yeah, horrible experience for the patient if you want to take it out on the local anesthesia. And we do see some infections of the bone borne distractors in the palate. So if I can choose, uh, I would go for a Hyrax instead of a TPD. So the effect of the sarmy, which we want to create, is the widening of the smile line to give uh, the smile line a positive curve and to, to actually aesthetically enhance the smile line to resolve the crowding problem in the upper jaw, especially if the patient already had two premolars extracted in the past. And by using SARMI, we do see some increase of the dental show. In some patients, it can be beneficial, but in patients with gummy smell, um, this is not a very positive effect. So the patient should be informed beforehand. SARMI also leads to a mild chin retrusion because the anterior part of the upper jaw is being uh, place more caudally, and we see some kind of ala widening uh, between two to four millimeters. So for patients with a narrow nose, SARMI can be beneficial, but for someone who already has a very wide uh, nasal base, SARMI uh, should be taken uh, with care, uh, the decision of whether to do SARMI or not. In recent research, we also see that by doing SARMI, in one third of the patients, there will be recession of the central papilla which is devastating for the dental smile line. And so for the patients with very high aesthetic demands, you have to take this aspect into account as well. And the patients who are older, who has a big a distance between the cervical uh, crestal bone and the contact point, and who has a very narrow and elongated uh, incisor crowns, as well as incisor overlap, these are the risk, patients who are at risk of getting recession of the central papilla after SARM. Another aspect of the pre-orsical orthodontics is that if we have created an overjet right, by aligning the dental arches properly, after surgical advancement, the last molar in the upper jaw will usually do not have any function, and therefore it will erupt very slowly, and sometimes it can cause pain problems in the cheek area of the patient during mastication. So um, when we anticipate these kind of big uh, mandibular advancements, uh, we tend to tell the patient that he or she may lose the second or third molar in the upper jaw, just uh, to, be, uh, in, to uh, overcome these kind of potential problems. Uh, we also have a specialized uh, protocol for patients with anterior open bites because class two patients with anterior open bites is about a fifth or a quarter of our patient population. Um, the, the problem of treating patients with anterior open bites is a high chance of relapse. So uh, despite surgery and uh, proper orthodontic treatments, we see a relapse rate of about 20 to 25% in these patients. So to decrease uh, relapse, uh, we look for um, the curve in the upper jaw when the patient first comes to our consultation room. In this case, you see that there is a so-called biplane in the upper arch. So the uh, lateral incisor to the lateral incisor are placed more cranially than the other parts of the jaw. So in this kind of cases, uh, first, we just orthodontically align and level the upper jaw. And afterwards, about three months before surgery, we cut the orthodontic wire at the place where the biplane was present. So in this case, we cut the wire between the lateral incisor and the cuspid. And then we do passive orthodontics in the upper jaw for about three months. If there, we see any kind of vertical relapse of the anterior segment, uh, we, if we do not see any relapse and the, uh, and the incisor stay at the same level, then we can perform a one-piece level one osteotomy in combination with BSSO. If there is any kind of relapse, uh, as you can see in this case, then we plan a segmented level one osteotomy um, in order to align the biplane dental arch surgically. So uh, by using this protocol in Nijmegen, uh, we see that the number of relapse after surgery is decreasing for the group with anterior open bite. So to sum up, in the pre-orthodontic uh, phase, 
uh, we have to consider uh, extractions, especially in the lower jaw or upper jaw, to facilitate jaw movements so that we can obtain an um, optimized uh, facial uh, profile after surgery. We should always be aware of the potential transverse discrepancy, especially in class two patients. And we should also anticipate the potential post-operative relapse, especially in case of anterior open bite, by um, indicating a segmented level one osteotomy uh, for the right patients. Now, let's uh, move on to the third uh, step, the preoperative documentation of these patients. So about uh, six months before the anticipated date of surgery, I see the patient once again at the office of the orthodontist just to check the execution of the pre-surgical orthodontics to see whether the planned um, uh, orthodontic overjet uh, is achieved and to see whether the inclination of the incisors and the transverse relationship are being uh, corrected properly. Uh, at this stage, we determine which kind of surgery we are going to do, and uh, we tell the patients when the surgery will be planned. About uh, two to four weeks before the planned surgery, the patient come to my office, to our outpatient clinic, to do the preoperative documentation, which consists of a clinical examination of the patient and uh, a very uh, long conversation uh, about the expectations of the patient and also about what I can achieve for the patients. To align the expectations, I think it's very important before surgery uh, to increase the satisfaction of the patient afterwards. And after uh, having these uh, clinical measurements, we will go to the stage of the 3D virtual surgical planning, which I'll explain later on. So during uh, at this stage, we will combine the information and the measurements of the soft tissue with that of the dentition in order to translate the clinical observations into a 3D virtual surgical plan, which is the goal of this stage. And we examine the patients clinically in their natural head position, which is de defined as a physiological position of the head when both eyes are looking uh, horizontally at a distance focus point with the muscles relaxed. I think the second element, relaxed muscles, is very important uh, at this stage, especially if we want to do a soft tissue driven planning. And the soft tissue should be documented when the, all the muscles are being relaxed. You should prevent any form of lip or mental straining, um, which are usually uh, present uh, in class two uh, patients, especially those with anterior open bite. So if you look at the, the pre scan on the right side, I do see some form of lip straining. So this is, in my view, unacceptable. I instruct the patient to relax. And then now you see a very big difference eh, in how the lip uh, shape is actually changing eh, from a strained shape to a more relaxed shape. And this is really um, uh, important for soft tissue driven and 3D planning. Um, um, we can uh, perform a lot of different measurements of the pay, uh, at my office, but in to order to increase the, the time efficiency of the consultation and to increase that reproducibility and the relevance of these uh, taking these measurements, I only uh, measure four items. They are the vertical position of the maxilla, the left-right positioning of the maxilla, the occlusal cant, and the facial asymmetry. So first, I um, let the patient stand in front of me in natural head position uh, with the lips uh, very relaxed. I measure the dental show at rest, so the distance between the upper lip and the incisal edge. And um, afterwards, I tell a good joke to the patient so that the patient smiles spontaneously. And it is at this stage, I see what is a dental show when the patient is laughing and smiling. And I take this measurement as well. Afterwards, I measure the midline of the upper dentition in relation to the soft tissue nasium or the facial midline. This is the second measurement which I note down. And then I look at the occlusal cant in relation to the bipupillar line. In case that the bipupillar line is not horizontal, I look at 
and the occlusal cant or the height difference between the cusp of the left uh, uh, cuspid and the cusp of the right cuspid in the vertical direction. So the vertical difference in cusp uh, height of the left and right cuspid will be noted as well. And the last item which I know down is the um, midline uh, deviation of the lower dentition um, in relation to the chin midline. Right? Because if there is a deviation, a big deviation, more than two millimeters between the midline of the lower dentition and the chin midline, um, I will, I may consider a genioplasty in order uh, to uh, correct the chin deviation, the lateral deviation of the chin surgically. And it is also at this last stage when I um, try to notice any form of facial asymmetry, for example, the height asymmetry at the lower border, the height or the width asymmetry and the mandibular angles, as well as asymmetry at the level of the zygoma. All these asymmetries will be noted down as well. So to sum up, um, the clinical measurements which I have taken will determine the, the vertical position of the maxilla, the transverse position of the maxilla, as well as the roll rotation of the maxilla. By taking clinical photographs and CBCT, the AP uh, movement of the maxilla, the pitch of the bimax complex, uh, as well as the yaw, will be determined during the stage of the virtual surgical planning. So only so the clinical measurements will only help me uh, in half of the movements which I will be planning for the maxilla. Um, after clinical examination, patients will undergo 3D stereophotogrammetry, intraoral scanning, as well as CBCT. First, the intraoral scan will be fused with the CBCT, and soft tissue will be rendered. And afterwards, the 3D stereophotogrammetry will be uh, fused onto the soft tissue envelope of the CBCT to create a photorealistic virtual head model. And uh, having this head model is really important for the further planning uh, because on these head models, we plan uh, the maxillary and mandibular movements in six degrees of freedom. There are three translations, anterior, posterior, left, right, and up-down translations, as well as three types of rotations, which are the roll, the pitch, and the yaw. Well, just to give you a, a, an idea, uh, the roll, is this um, rotation from the frontal view. The pitch okay, is a rotation from the incisal point as a hinge axis. And also the yaw will be also a rotation of the posterior maxilla and posterior mandible from the hinge point at the incisal point. And having uh, gone through, having known that we can plan the position of the maxilla and mandible in six degrees of freedom, we also have to determine the final occlusion. And this is the first stage of virtual surgical planning, which I usually do, the determination of the virtual occlusion. I find it very important to have the function in the software so that we can determine the virtual occlusion in a, a virtual way. So I do not use any models. Instead, by putting uh, virtual springs in the incisal area and putting springs in the molar areas, I let the algorithm calculate what is the best fit occlusion. I think this method is more advantageous to the method of putting plaster cast together and digitalizing the plaster cast, because with this method, I can correct the virtual occlusion at any stage during virtual surgical planning. Sometimes I see that because of occlusion, the lower jaw is being deviated to a certain side. By changing the occlusion, I can minimize these undesired mandibular or maxillary movements. So I think uh, you should always be able to change the virtual occlusion during the, uh, the surgical planning. Um, okay, so this is the uh, importance of virtual occlusion. Uh, first, I determine the left-right translation of the, uh, of the maxilla. And this is being determined by the clinical measurements which I take. So I align the midline of the maxilla with 
a nasium, the soft tissue nasium of the face to correct the, any asymmetry in the transverse direction. Afterwards, I look at the facial soft tissue profile of the patient to determine where the soft tissue nasale and the upper lip should be positioned in relation to the, to the nose. And I look at the nasal labial angle and the soft tissue na na angle, as well as the protrusion of the upper lip. So the ability of the software to give a photorealistic and also accurate uh, prediction of the soft tissue is very important because this determines my anterior posterior positioning of the maxilla. And afterwards, I position the maxilla vertically in the right way uh, by making sure that the post-operative dental show will be about two to four millimeters or according to the wish of the patient. Some patients want to have more dental show that I tend to move the maxilla more caudally. Some patients want to have less dental show that I try to uh, impact the maxilla more cranially. After setting the three translations, I correct now the three rotations. By using uh, the row correction, I can correct the occlusal cans, but you should always consider the height of the lower border because sometimes, as in this case, correction of the occlusal cans can deteriorate the lower border height difference between the left and right side. Afterwards, I change the pitch of the biomaterial complex in such a way that the chin projection will be correct in relation. In, then I usually look at the soft tissue pogonium. And lastly, I use the York correction to uh, reduce flaring, especially in case of class two anterior um, uh, mandibular movements. And I can correct the posterior asymmetry of the lower jaw. In, when I perform a chin osteotomy virtually, I also look at the angle at which the chin osteotomy should be uh, virtually um, planned. In case that I only want a chin advancement, uh, I will plan a low angle chin osteotomy. Whereas if I also want to shorten the height of the chin, I tend to plan a more high angle chin osteotomy so the chin will move anteriorly and also cranially. After making the planning, uh, we have to perform surgery uh, uh, because this lecture is more about principles and not about surgical techniques. Uh, I'll mainly talk about the sequence of surgery. And there has been a lot of debate on this topic to either do a maxilla first surgery or mandible first surgery. If we look at literature, then we see in 1978, uh, uh, the American Steinhauser said, yeah, there's a new uh, surgical sequence that's called a mandible first. Uh, so he proposed you should do mandible first in order to obtain more accurate results. And 20 years later, uh, Larry Wolford also said the same. Uh, do not do maxilla first, you should do more and more mandible first surgery because it improves your surgical accuracy and also predictability and stability of the results. Um, however, in 2011, uh, Tim Turvey uh, from Chapel Hill also published a paper and he said, yeah, well, you can also do maxilla first or mandible first depending on the surgeon's confidence. So it's actually very subjective whether you do maxilla first or mandible first. And in 2014, another publication from a Brazilian group has said, actually, it does not really matter whether you operate on the mandible or, uh, or maxilla first because the accuracy is comparable. So in order to address uh, this dilemma, uh, we set up a retro uh, a prospective study in 2015. And by using voxel-based matching, we tried to match the post-operative position of the maxilla and mandible uh, to the um, planning in order to see whether the maxilla first or mandible first is more accurate. So this is one of the biggest uh, clinical trials where we have been performed in our department. And the result of the clinical trial has shown that only uh, is that there is only a very big difference, a statistic significant difference between maxilla first and mandible first when you want to perform a big pitch, which is then in favor of the mandible first sequence. If you look at uh, the pitch, uh, the different um, rotations, 
which are more accurate, you see that the maxilla first group or the mandible first group, they're really quite comparable. Uh, they're not much different to each other. If we look at the three translations, we also see similar results. Um, you should look more closely at the front back, the AP translations, because the AP translations results has shown that the maxilla first is actually more accurate than mandible first, because you only have to seat the condyle once in maxilla first sequence, whereas you have to see the condyle twice in mandible first sequence. If we go more and more into these details, uh, so for the maxillary anterior movements, we definitely see that maxillary first sequence can achieve a more accurate result compared to the mandible first sequence. If we look at the mandibular anterior movements, we see a similar trend, but this was not statistically significant. Considering the pitch, which is very important to determine the chin position, we see if we plan a clockwise pitch, then in mandible first sequence, uh, it is we can achieve this planned pitch more accurately. So from this study, we can uh, actually conclude that you should always operate on the maxilla first, unless you have planned a large clockwise or counterclockwise pitch, or if you want to do segmental for one osteotomy, then you should, in these two cases, you should consider mandible first surgery. And more and more, um, our research results are being appreciated. For example, in the last Madrid conference, the European conference for oral maxillofacial surgery, uh, our study was quoted many times in keynote lectures, and even Arnett, who advocated always a mandible first sequence, uh, actually uh, said to me, yeah, well, uh, Tom, I think, yeah, you've done a good job and uh, I'm changing slowly. So um, so I think uh, we can conclude that you should operate on the maxilla first. And the last part, which I would like to discuss is a post-operative evaluation. In order to improve our own surgical skills and to improve the draft of the surgical plan, we should systematically evaluate whether we have performed surgery according to the 3D planning. And this is what we have been doing since 2013, already for 10 years. We've been gathering um, data uh, in every surgery which we have performed. So after each surgery, we perform voxel-based matching of the post-operative results with a 3D planning in order to calculate what is a discrepancy between the planned movement and the achieved movement. Every Monday morning, uh, I'm confronted with these uh, numbers. So sometimes uh, I was a little sad, but afterwards uh, it's okay again, because then I try to learn from my own mistakes. So um, in this kind of automated uh, analysis, um, uh, we, we uh, let a computer algorithm to match the pre-operative pre situation to the post-operative situation. And by plotting uh, three different landmarks at the incisor point and at the molars, we can understand the differences better than just looking at the average movement of the whole maxilla. So for example, uh, in this patient case, the analysis will tell us that in the left right um, um, in situation, that uh, I have not, uh, I have, um, there, there has been a planned movement of 1.0 millimeter to the left. However, I have positioned the upper jaw 0.4 to the right. So there is a discrepancy of 1.4 millimeters to the right. And the same can be done for all different kinds of uh, translations and rotations. So in all six degrees of freedom, we analyze these post-operative surgical results. And we do the same with a mandible. And in this way, um, we have built up a very big database so that now we are using AI to see whether we can predict in which cases uh, we will be uh, able to operate the patients accurately and in which cases we should be aware of. Um, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation with one uh, case report. So this is a 21-year-old woman 
uh, who visited uh, our office with a cheap complaint, uh, the big overjets. And she is also not so pleased about the small line which she has, which has a negative curve and which is actually a little bit too narrow. Uh, um, definitely, um, uh, if you compare it to her facial width. And this is a dental situation. There's a class two uh, malocclusion, and there is a kind of midline asymmetry of the lower uh, dentition to the right because she's missing a three six. So there has been some uh, compensation going on in the dental arches, and there is a very big uh, overjet. And this is the OPG. Yeah, so this is her dental situation. And we have also uh, made digitalized uh, models to see um, the transverse uh, dimension. So if we uh, analyze this case, we can say it's a case with class two with mandibular hypoplasia. We see that there is a deep curve of speed and also asym asymmetry in the dental arch. So we uh, decide to extract the three five uh, so that we can level the curve and we can resolve the dental asymmetry. Uh, there is mandibular hypoplasia, which uh, needed a dent BSO advancement. And there's crowding of the upper jaw and also a very narrow upper jaw. So um, we decided to do a SARMI. So this is uh, the SARMI operation, which we uh, performed by using a Hyrax, a two-spawn distractor. And this is the dental arch before SARMI. And after SARMI, as you can see, with a little bit of uh, orthodontics, you can already correct the negative smile line and you can broaden the upper arch and prepare it for the very large BSSO advancements. So this is the pre-operative documentation of the patients. We look at her facial profile, so her chin should definitely uh, be advanced uh, by a lot. And if we look at her nasal form, she has a quite a favorable nose. Uh, so uh, if we want to do a level one osteotomy to intrude the maxilla, we know that the nose will be a little bit wider uh, as it is, uh, but it is acceptable. So this is uh, the aligned uh, dental arch. And the upper arch is very broad and so that we do not have uh, a transverse problem after BSO advancements. And this is a natural head position of the patients. Uh, we used to project laser lines onto the face of the patient and take a 3D photo of that. And then after aligning the laser line in the virtual environment, we can translate the clinical natural head position very accurately to the virtual environment. So this is a virtual osteotomy, which we have been taken. We decided to correct the midline of the, uh, of the maxilla. And afterwards, we gave it a counterclockwise row to correct the occlusal cant. Uh, we used a soft tissue simulation to see that, yeah, we wanted a little bit of advancement of the maxilla uh, to decrease the nasal labial angle and to give the upper lip a little bit of more protrusion to give her a little bit more of an empty face. And we impacted uh, the upper jaw due to the gummy smile. And we used a virtual occlusal tool to set the final occlusion. And uh, this is the position of the lower jaw after final occlusion, which is in our view uh, quite okay. So we did not need any clockwise or counterclockwise pitch of the bimax with complex. And then we made uh, the splints. So this is the skeletal uh, form in final occlusion. So uh, I use the intermediate splint and the final splint to perform maxilla first uh, sequenced bimax ray osteotomy. And this is uh, the final results uh, of the patient. And so you see that the small line is being enhanced and the nasal form has become a little bit wider, but it's still acceptable. And the AP profile has improved quite a lot, including the surgical angle. And this is occlusion. And we performed matching. So you see the great amount of manual advancements which we have achieved. And you also see the lateral flaring of the angles in such cases. So this is a preoperative situation. And this is a postoperative situation. So this is the kind of result that we achieve nowadays with a soft tissue based planning. So in orthokinetic surgery 1.0, there was a focus only on occlusion, only on cephalometric measurements and model surgery. And 80% of surgery was 
uh, Monomax. And nowadays we use soft tissue driven 3D virtual surgical planning to plan the surgery, the tooth movement and jaw movements based on soft tissue profile analysis. And 80% of surgery is nowadays a Biomax to enhance the facial profile. And I'll uh, wrap up the uh, presentation in two minutes by uh, just going through the highlight of part three, less is more. Uh, I think this is uh, a further enhancement of the workflow, which we have been adopting until 2021. From 2021 onwards, I've been working on with a colleague from the Department of Orthodontics and with a 3D lab on one day diagnostics and one stage surgery to uh, decrease the duration of the treatment and to increase the predictability of the results. So this is a workflow that we are now being using. So on the day that the patient is admitted or referred to our outpatient clinic, we perform a data-driven and AI-assisted um, virtual planning of the orthodontic treatment, surgical treatment, and the facial profile. And the whole treatment plan will be determined uh, on the same day. And by a grouping surgery, such as condylectomy, combining it with Bimax, with genioplasty, with contour corrections, with soft tissue corrections, such as lipofilling, and also the use of implants, uh, we try to do one stage surgery. So instead of SARMI and, and Bimax, we now uh, combine all surgery into one surgery by using navigation or by using uh, surgical templates. And in this way, we hope that uh, in a few years time, uh, I can present uh, this new way of surgery in front of you. And this is one of the papers we have been working on, the AI-driven 3D soft tissue planning. And I think this is the future that orthokinetic surgery is going. Uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, I would like to uh, thank uh, the Professor Scholz and Dr. Ron Veras from our Department of Orthodontics and our head of departments, uh, Professor Stepan Berger, and my dear uh, colleague, orthopedic surgeon, Jeroen Dibrax, who have done uh, a lot of research with me. And of course, the help of 3D lab from uh, Professor Thomas Mao, and also the chief engineer, Frank Baum, which is also helping the research uh, with Changu Memorial Hospital. And I would like to uh, thank you all for your time and attention at this hour. I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. C. And now, um, the next we will went to the uh, we will go to the panelist discussion. So, uh, the first one I would like to invite Dr. Bowan, Professor Bowan, please uh, give your thoughts on this session. Actually, uh, I think it's very very clear that uh, Dr. Z just give us very very informative and interesting uh, lecture and of course we do agree about the, the changing of the 1.0 plan to a soft tissue or 3d plan is very very interesting and of course the program you use is also i think is very very useful program in mahido university thailand bangkok we use mostly dolphin I don't know if you have some idea to, to, to share about this program or any discussion about uh, this program. Thank you, much, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Professor, I think, for, yeah, for your kind words. Uh, I think, yeah, at our department, uh, as you probably have seen in the presentation, we've been using uh, at the first 10 years the program accident to do the soft tissue driven planning. And from 2016 onwards, we are using the IPS case designer from the KOS Martin company, uh, in which we also uh, did a, a part of the validation of the software at its early stages. Um, I've been uh, uh, trying Dolphin out. I think Dolphin is a very powerful tool, which actually has more, much more functionalities than the IPS case designer that I've been using. Uh, Dolphin is able to perform all different kinds of surgery. You can measure uh, skeletal movement, soft tissue movement, dental movements in any uh, uh, position that you want. Um, I think that the difference in Dolphin software and the IPS software, which I'm using, is mainly the soft tissue simulation. Uh, I think that's a major difference. 
uh, because um, our workflow is highly dependent on the soft tissue profile of the patient uh, that is uh, desired postoperatively. We need a software that can simulate the soft tissue movements very accurately. Uh, we've been performing with Denmark universities from the Odense University with Dr. Stockbro research on the accuracy of, Den of Dolphin versus uh, IPS case designer in soft tissue um, and simulation. And, and I think several researchers have also focused on this topic. And I, at least for the class two patients, it seems that IPS case design has a little bit more accuracy in the soft tissue planning than Dolphin. And I think that's the reason why we have adopted the IPS case designer. That will not say that Dolphin is not a good software. I think it's, Dolphin is really good in encephalometry, in research, uh, but I think IPS case designer is uh, more efficient in, uh, in, in, in making these 3D virtual plannings because the time that it takes from loading the CBCT uh, to finishing the design of an intermediate splint is about 20 minutes. And I think that's quite fast compared to any other software which is on the market. Thanks, Stella, for your answer. Uh, and another player, could I ask one more question or let uh, other uh, panelists, or maybe the other panelists first, please? Or okay. Other colleagues, please. <laughs> Uh, the next one, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Liao, um, Professor Liao. Could you please share, open the camera and share your screen uh, and, and, and hey. talk to us? <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Dr. C, nice to see you. <laughs> I was um, learning a lot from you. your lecture. I have three questions for you. The first, Regarding a soft tissue based planning, what kind of soft tissue analysis do you use? Is it clinically accurate? And does it include the incisor show prediction? Yes, I think it's a very uh, sharp question that you're asking. Um, I think uh, the soft tissue analysis that we are using is based on the soft tissue analysis, which is described in the book that is published by uh, Arnett with McGlawlin. So it's mainly the Arnett analysis based on the true vertical line. And, and, and this is being used usually for the class two Caucasian patients of the Dutch origin, uh, because I think the Arnett analysis is based on a small group of Caucasian patients with a certain facial profile. So um, by using uh, these reference values as a base, for the soft tissue planning, uh, we can uh, do a, like a rough draft of the soft tissue planning. And also we incorporate the patient's uh, desire, the, the wish of the patient also into the planning. Uh, so if the Arnett has said uh, the soft tissue pogonium for a female patient should be about four millimeters behind the true vertical line. However, some female patients, they want to look like Angelina Jolie who has much more pronounced a lower jaw. In these kinds of cases, we tend to uh, plan the soft tissue pogonium uh, about two millimeters or even on the uh, true vertical line. Whereas in some um, female patients, they think that uh, yeah, they are afraid that their chin is too protruded after uh, bimax free advancement. And in these cases, I tend to plan about six millimeters behind the true vertical line. So. I think the true vertical line is really the reference for majority of our 3D planning um, and it's being modified uh, by the yeah, wish of the patient. However, I think in three uh, class three cases, uh, that is uh, more difficult, the soft tissue based planning, because um, uh, many patients uh, in the Dutch population, class three patients, they have a maxillary hypoplasia. Uh, that means that the whole maxilla is being positioned more posteriorly. So the soft tissue um, uh, subnasale uh, on which the true vertical line is based, it is also skewed. Uh, so if you plot the true vertical line in that kind of cases, uh, it's not accurate because it is uh, positioned too backwardly. So in these cases, we tend to use the so-called anticipated uh, true vertical line. In other words, uh, the, the 
the upper lip position, which the patients want to have his or her upper lip at. And then we place a true vertical line at that position, and then use this true vertical line to position the mandible and the chin. I hope that this kind of gives you an answer to your question. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, what's the timing for high condylectomy? And do you see any abnormal growth after the surgery? And how many percent of the patients still need the OGS to correct the manipulative symmetry after skeletal maturity? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, the goal of the high condylectomy is to stop condylar growth at the, at the site where a condylar hyperplasia is taking place. Um, the age of the patients uh, when the diagnosis is being made is very important. If it's a female patient um, um, with class one occlusion with asymmetry uh, of the jaw to the left, if she is about 12 years old, if we perform a high condylectomy, um, the jaw growth will normalize probably to about 80% of the normal value, which is usually acceptable for avoiding orthokinetic surgery. However, if such a patient is presents herself when he or she is when she's 16 at my office, then the question is, will high condylectomy resolve the asymmetry that has already been uh, present uh, during the growth? I think when uh, the patient is 16 in a female patient, in half of the cases, orthokinetic surgery still has to be done. Whereas in an adult patient who is about 25 years old with uh, hyperplasia of the condyle, I definitely, I think in 90% of cases or 95% of cases have to do orthokinetic surgery because the lower jaw and also the upper jaw have been growing so asymmetrically throughout the past 10 years that uh, correction is required despite the, condyle, uh, the high condylectomy. Okay. And the third question is, what are the indications of SAMI and uh, segmental level one for transverse discrepancy? Yes, um, I think um, uh, in my hands, if I perform a level one osteotomy uh, in, in segment, uh, either in two piece, three piece or four piece to expand the, the lateral parts of the maxilla, uh, I, I feel a lot of pressure of the of the soft tissue or from the palate or from the cheek afterwards, pushing these segments back to its uh, to their normal position. And so usually uh, up to about four or five millimeters of transverse discrepancy, I consider a level one uh, a multi-piece level one osteotomy to uh, correct the transverse discrepancy. If the discrepancy is more than five or six millimeters, I tend to use a SARMI or uh, nowadays a MARP uh, instead of SARMI, so a mini screw assisted uh, rapid uh, expansion uh, to do these kind of expansions. Because I find that surgical expansion is less stable in the post uh, surgical period. And usually I even make a kind of uh, stabilization, uh, um, a kind of grid, which I put in the palate to make sure that these lateral. The segment cannot flare back into the original position post-operatively, but even uh, with these uh, instruments, I still uh, see relapse afterwards after level one expansion in multi pieces. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would like to invite Professor Lo, uh, please uh, give us your thoughts and discussion on on this session, please. <clears throat> Uh, hi, Dr. Tongxi. Uh, it's very nice to hear your lecture again. Uh, I do like to uh, hear your comment. Uh, of course, many people will have soft tissue issue, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, I, I, in my, uh, in my planning, I, I also feel that soft tissue prediction is, is not easy. And uh, especially for the uh, incisor show. So I, I, you know, move the bone and I look at the patient picture and I predict the movement. And uh, in, in your head, you, you, you mentioned that your software is kind of more accurate in predicting the soft tissue. I just wonder if you 
uh, when you finish your virtual surgical plan and during the operation, you either do maxilla first or mandible first. You just go ahead to continue the surgical procedure, or you will judge uh, during the pro uh, during the operation, and you may or may not modify the surgical plan. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lo. It's great to see you again. Uh, I think, yeah, your statement is very right. I think soft tissue is the issue, and right? that's definitely the case. Um, if you talk about um, uh, 3D uh, planning, um, I think the most of the accuracy studies that have been done in the 3D uh, prediction models is on the AP movement and maybe a little bit on the transverse movement of the nasal base. Uh, there has been very little research being done in the vertical uh, sense, yeah? so in predicting the dental show. And that is, in my opinion, also the most difficult part of surgery. I think predicting the downgrafting or disimpaction of the maxilla is easier right? because usually uh, if I see the dental show at rest in the clinic is two millimeters, if surgically, if I advance the maxilla by two millimeters and then extrude the maxilla by two millimeters, I will get there where I want to have. Um, however, the impaction, that is, I think, the most difficult part. In some patients, uh, if I impact the, the upper jaw four millimeters, uh, the dental show will decrease by 3.5 millimeters. In some patients, I, if I impact four millimeters, it will on, only decrease by two millimeters. Um, and that is something which I find very unpredictable. Um, so as every surgeon, I have redo surgery. And uh, I can remember the one of the first redo surgeries I've done is that I've impacted the upper jaw too much because and the patient complained of lack of dental show afterwards. And, uh, and then I choose to impact less according to the virtual surgical planning. And then the next one I see, yeah, there's an excess of uh, a gummy smell. Uh, in my opinion, it depends also on the sickness of the soft tissue in the lip region and in the paranasal region, and also the direction of the pitch of the maxilla. If the maxilla is being pitched in a clockwise direction, it is more difficult to impact, whereas in a counterclockwise direction, it's more predictable to impact. That is, I think, what I can say from my limited experience. I think, yeah, you have operated definitely much more patients than me, and I don't know what is your... So uh, Thoughts on these. But what well, so so this is the planning. I mean, uh, do you change your plan during the operation if you see that oh, uh, you need to modify some procedure? Uh, usually, I do not change my plan during the operation. So you just go ahead to do the surgery. <laughs> go ahead, and then, uh, and then uh, sometimes during surgery, I had a bad feeling. It looks as if that the occlusal tent is not right. It's as if the vertical height is not right. But after surgery it tends to be quite okay. Whereas every time I change uh, the plan during surgery, the results are suboptimal. Uh, so I tend to okay. stick to surgery, uh, to the surgical plan. Definitely uh, in the height, because I think when in a supine position, uh, the, the lip is differently positioned than in an upright position of the patient. So I don't dare to change the vertical planning during surgery. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, the second issue that I always have, and I I, I, actually, I don't have the correct uh, answer, is that uh, how to position the, the dental midline, uh, especially for patient with credit palate deformity, uh, or patient with facial asymmetry, you can see that nasal dorsal may be deviated, uh, uh, the future may be deviated, so you see a lot of uh, skeletal midline, dental midline, soft tissue midline, or filtrum and nasodosum. So how do you align this midline during your surgical planning? Uh, I uh, agree to you completely in this, uh, I think, on, on this matter, because um, in asymmetry patients, uh, what I usually uh, look for is whether there is a harmonious asymmetry or uh, a less harmonious asymmetry or less <laughs> harmonious asymmetry, uh, because sometimes, um, uh, yeah, if you categorize these asymmetric patients, you can see a group of harmonious asymmetric patients. What do I say harmonious? 
every part, uh, the, the nose, the philtrum, the, the upper jaw, lower jaw, chin is asymmetrical, but the face looks attractive. You don't tend to see a lot of <laughs> asymmetry. And you see some patients which you see asymmetry immediately. And then I always wonder, why do you see some asymmetry you regard as uh, less aesthetically a problem as another asymmetry? I think it has to do uh, with the height of the orbit and also the height of the lower border. Sometimes you have a, a well, a congruent asymmetry where everything tends to be on a focal point. And so especially in case of hemifacial microsomia, in these patients, if you correct the asymmetry from the frontal view, at the midline, it looks better. But from the transverse direction, it looks worse after surgery because you, the soft tissue, the part where you have access, you will get even more soft tissue access. And where you have lack of soft tissue, it gets less. Some patients, uh, the, the parallelity of the bipupil line and the mandibular border asymmetry is then uh, on the other side, in these patients, uh, I think the results tend to be better. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Wu. And uh, Dr. Pawan, please uh, share your thoughts more. Yes, actually, I have uh, a little, actually, is some questions that maybe is not related to the topic you talk that's why maybe I hesitate to ask that question. Okay, the question is, uh, when the patients come with uh, a symmetry with condylar hyperplasia, maybe in the age around 18, 19, and actually from we sent, uh, underwent the, the bone scan and resulted in higher uptake. But anyway, most of them like to wait a couple of years, maybe a few years later, to see if it can be stopped by itself or not. That's why I like to ask for your idea or your uh, maybe protocol from your clinic. How long could you can wait for the stop of the hyperplasia? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, um, um... Uh, I think in, in majority of the cases, if there is a hypoplasia and if the clinical presentation of the, uh, of the asymmetry is congruent with the result from the spec scan or the PET-CT, um, uh, then um, uh, I think in, because there are some researchers, they say that they stop at about age of 25. It, it depends on, of course, the class one, class two, class three patients. But however, at least in the class two cases, which I see eh, in majority of the cases, um, I have an idea that um, in more than 50% of cases, it doesn't stop. It goes on. I've been uh, treating patients who is, who's been 35 or 40 with unilateral condylar hypoplasia and a, a mild class two de jaw deformity. And it just seems that one side just continuously goes on. But of course it can, because of uh, maybe less accurate diagnosis at the first stage, uh, because uh, according to the Vol Wolfert classification of 2016, you have the 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3, and 4. Um, uh, I, I tend to see more and more patients with small amount of osteochondroma in class two patients, where the condylar uh, form is also changing uh, throughout the years. And these changes, they never stop. Well, really, the classical condylar hyperplasia, they may stop at about 20 or 25 years of old. Yeah. Uh, and the, um, so the timing of surgery is important in, in this group because um, the majority of the patients who are referred to from the orthodontist are about between 14 and also 17 years of age um, because we know that it will continue uh, to 20 or 25 years old, and the severity of the asymmetry will get uh, worse. And so then we tend to do something about it. And that is usually also what the patient and their parents are really opting for. And perhaps, yeah, this is a kind of answer to your question. Thanks for your idea and your answers. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bowen. And the next, we will go for the question from the participants. Uh, the first question from uh, Dr. Samara uh, would like to ask about uh, the SAMI and SAPI are the same. What is the difference? Yes, thank you for the question. I think that's the same. It's just a terminology. The SAMI is a maxillary expansion and SARPI is a palatal expansion. I think there is no difference between the two, only in the way how you write them. So some researchers, they call them SARMI and some SARPI. I think it's from the tradition from which the clinic is actually from. And because, uh, yeah, the head of department before uh, Professor Berger at our department was actually trained as a fellow of opera gazer, we tend to use uh, his term in our department more but it's really from the historic point of view. Okay, and uh, thank you for, for answering. And the next question uh, from Dr. J.H. Um, doctor just would like to ask, what program do for the virtual spring occlusion? Uh, pardon, the virtual occlusion, you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, you mean how to do the virtual occlusion? Uh, what the program? I think maybe uh, this yes, doctor would like to the ask. Virtual yeah. occlusion by, yeah. uh, in the IPS case designer, we do the virtual mm -hmm. occlusion. So it has a virtual occlusion tool. And um, as I've shown in the animation, you have to put uh, three or more springs at the right place. And there is definitely a learning curve in doing that. So um, uh, I started doing virtual occlusion in 2008. At that time, every time I have to have class the class next to me. Then I look at where are the contact points, and then I see, ah, I have to put a spring from here to there, here to there, here to there. And after one year doing a lot of planning as a resident, then I find out, oh yeah, and yeah, now I try without the class the class. And I think it takes years of uh, exercise in order to um, be able to do it without any models in your hands. And um, how about the accuracy that did you see the change from you use it since the beginning? Uh, yes, uh, because uh, we have been, uh, it's a very good question because there is a learning curve in doing 3D virtual planning. Uh, we've just been published, we have just published a paper in at the beginning of this year, April, in the clinical oral investigations on the learning curve in using 3D uh, virtual surgical planning. Uh, we've analyzed the accuracy, the surgical accuracy um, from in the period 2017 to 2022 20, by using IPS case designer. And we see there has been an increase in surgical accuracy. And after five years, there's still no plateau. And so uh, I think if you um, do the virtual occlusion, I think that is definitely accurate uh, because yeah, it's, it is actually uh, consists of two intraoral scans and you just move these scans into a certain position, I think it should be theoretically definitely be more accurate than classic cast. And we have been, there is also research from our department saying that the virtual uh, occlusion is definitely as accurate as a plastic cast. If you want the publication, I can send it to you. Thank you. And the next patient from Dr. Yimi. Uh, dear Dr. C, I would like to ask about the guideline you use for the surgery. Uh, the first question regarding to use uh, the use of TVL as the soft tissue landmark for OGS planning. In your opinion, is TVL a good guideline for Asian population which nose projection is not permanent as Caucasian? Um, yes, thank you for the question. I think the, the true vertical line uh, is not a good idea to use in class three patients, especially in Asian patients, and uh, especially from the perspective in which TVL has been introduced by Arnett and uh, McLaughlin in 2014 in their book, because it's really being used in the Caucasian population and it's being based on very small population, these normative values, and I don't think they represent the Asian population in any way. Uh, so uh, in Asian class three patients, we should not use these uh, TVLs and the value. You can use the true vertical line, but then you should establish the new normative values uh, according to the true vertical line. And um, 
beside the true vertical line, which we have not mentioned in my presentation, is also there has been many, many reference lines on soft tissue driven planning. The Alfaro uh, from uh, Barcelona has uh, proposed a so called uh, soft tissue nasal line or the Barcelona line. Uh, I think that is also a line that cannot be used for Asian population because uh, even for some Dutch, uh, a majority of the Dutch patients, which I see, such a Barcelona line cannot be used in the Dutch population because the Barcelona line says, yeah, your incisor should be placed at least uh, well, in front of uh, anterior to the Barcelona line. If I look at my patient population, I think 90% of the patients already have their incisors placed anterior to the Barcelona line, which would uh, well imply that I don't need any before one osteotomy, which is, of course, not the case. So I think every um, reference line should be examined uh, on uh, upon which population it is based and where it is developed. Thank you for your great explanation. And the next question from Dr. Yimi, I would like to ask about since soft tissue production after surgery is not accurate, maybe related uh, that you discussed before, do you use the heart tissue landmark to evaluate the maxillary position as well, uh, such as the gabala vertical line? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I know that my, uh, I think this way of working on the soft tissue based planning is not so conventional. And um, it has been, of course, been criticized, which is which is good because it helps us to improve. Uh, is a, um, we do not perform any heart tissue based cephalometry of the patient. We only look at uh, with our net angle or with any manner of plane angle, just to look at the position of incisors in relation to the upper and lower jaw to see how we can perform the pre-surgical orthodontics and where we end up with uh, with how many million of overjet or um, and such kind of things. Uh, these are the things that we do measure, but we don't do any cephalometry. So, um, uh, yeah, if you ask me, yeah, what is the average SMA of my patient? I don't know, because I only perform these measurements for research purposes, but not for clinical purposes. Oh, thank you. And the last question from Dr. Ku Chen from Singapore. Uh, do you, do uh, in your class two alternative surgery cases? How many of them require a counterclockwise rotation of the MMC? Uh, when you design and when to use or not to use counterclockwise rotation? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I think I tend to use a counterclockwise rotation less. I think than the uh, big names in Europe have uh, been proposing. Uh, why? Because I always look at the dental smile line. And, and many, I think, class two patients uh, with short face, they have quite a flat occlusal line. Um, and they already have a protruded chin. So in these patients, I don't think that counterclockwise rotation is needed. In the hyperdivergent hyper cases, so the long face uh, class two cases, um, then the occlusal um, occlusal plane is more steep uh, in relation to the SN line or Frankfurt horizontal line. If you want to do some kind of counterclockwise rotation, uh, then I would do it in these kind of cases. Um, so these are nearly the only cases which I do counterclockwise rotation to correct the occlusal plane angle. Because why? Because it's also correlated to the smile line. Uh, so if the angle is very high, then the smile line is very steep. If the angle is very low, then you have a flat smile line. If the angle is negative, you have a negative smile line. And um, so, uh, which I really focus on is the dental smile line more and more, and the soft tissue profile. Sometimes the counterclockwise rotation is will deteriorate the dental smile line, and that is something which I will never do, because if I really want to have that more chin prominence then I can always do a genoplasty or chin ring or anything, anything in that kind of direction. And also Thank in you. An open bite <laughs> cases, okay. just to uh, oh, keep open keep bite that. cases, some people say with open, anterior open bite, you can also do counterclockwise rotation. But usually that's not the case because I think 90% of the patient with anterior open bites, they have an excess of gummy smile. If you do counterclockwise rotation, yeah, the gummy smile cannot be resolved and you end up with a negative smile line. So also in anterior open bite cases, 
and still tend to do more of a posterior maxillary impaction or a clockwise rotation because of the occlusal plane angle. Uh, thank you very much for the clear explanation. Uh, explanation. Um, as an autonic resident, I think uh, for the autonic treatment, some um, I mean, that's what I learned from some teacher. They tend to focus on soft tissue as well, rather than uh, about the teeth relationship. And uh, before we go for the good photos, I would like to uh, introduce the upcoming conference. Uh, please share the full screen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to have the Shangan Forum. will be on November 6 to 8. Uh, in Taipei, Taiwan this year. And that will be the numerous lecture and workshop that you can learn about the CLEP and OGS. And that will be a video demonstration from uh, in CLEP lip lip here from Dr. Ting Lu and workshop in pre-surgical NAM with Dr. Avero Figaro and Dr. Ilik Liu. Uh, if you're interested to join this program, please uh, catch her and go for the QR code to uh, like see more details and see the schedule of this conference. And the another upcoming conference uh, in sleep apnea, uh, it will be in Bangkok in December this year, the fourth Asian Society of Sleep Medicine 2023. Um, there will be a workshop in, CBC, uh, in CBT and also lecture and presentation from an international speaker. And Professor Yu Fang Liao will give the lecture at this conference. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ai to uh, introduce us about this conference, please. Oh. Oh. Hello, everybody. Uh, 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 nice to... Uh, Um, I think so sorry for technical problem. Um, Dr. Ai and Dr. Premtip uh, just how to organize this conference. And as the names of um, uh, doctors and dentists from Thailand, we welcome you all to visit this conference and also uh, visit Bangkok during this uh, the time of conference as well. And uh, thank you all participants to uh, attending this session, I think uh, we have the regular uh, discussion and also good questions from all participants. And next, we will go for the group photo. Dr. Joe, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prior, for your uh, wonderful moderating uh, for Professor She's the excellent and the comprehensive, uh, very organized. I think it's not very bad and the very... Uh, the, basic principle. It inside your lecture is involved some very advanced knowledge, including mastery first, uh, manipulable first, uh, high contelectomy. I don't think it's a very basic technology tool for very like me, like a student. It's an advancement. I thought we are looking for Professor C's the futures, the another uh, more and more advancement uh, uh, sharing your experience as well. So finally, I will invite all our participants and to open your screen and to, to give us a smile and we can have a group photo uh, with our uh, master, Professor C, and our um, panelist, Professor uh, Bo Wang from Thailand too, and uh, our Professor Yu Fan Liao, uh, Professor Lin Zhou Lo as well. And now, I uh, will come to come to three and please give me a wonderful smile. Just like Professor C say, no too much counterclockwise to make a no good smile. So give me a good smile, please. One, two, cheese. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for all our participants to come join this very great presentation. Uh, 
looking forward to you come visit Taiwan. And uh, I hope that one week later can see you in person in Taipei Grand Hotel to come join this the three combined symposium, Chang'an Forum 2023. Have a good night, have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bo Wan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Xi. Thank you, Thank you guys. Yes. Thank you, Prior. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Junior. Sawadika. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Have okay. a good day, Professor C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Prior. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Keep in touch. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye.